Well, good morning. My name is Anna, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm just glad to be able to worship with you and hear God's word. And so I thought we'd just start with a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to just gather, Lord, and be able to hear your word, Lord. We just thank you for a word that never changes, a word that guides us and confronts us, Lord. And so we just ask that what needs to be said be said today, and what needs to be heard be heard. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. So one of my favorite things to do is I like to go and check out new churches. I like to see what other churches are doing and see what I can bring back to the church that I'm serving at. And so in Nebraska, and that's where I used to live, one of my coworkers was like having an on-the-rocks relationship with God, and then something happened, and he was on fire for God, and he invited me to his church, and I love a good contemporary service, and so I said, sure, why not? And it was like a well-known church in Omaha, and so I thought, all right, let's go. And I do not remember the name of the church, but I do remember the experience quite distinctly. So it was like kind of a bigger church, so you drive in, and everyone's like, hi, 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 like a lot of hellos, okay? And then you... You walk in to the sanctuary, and it was like this auditorium. And so the lights were kind of low, and then there was a light on the stage so you could find your seat, right? And then the music starts, so the lights kind of go down low, and then it's like, and then it's like, and then these lights are like whirling around, right? And I, I swear to you, they start singing, and I see people come up, and there's like a mosh pit. And then I see kids, and they're like going like this. <laughs> and so at that point, I had to sit down. <laughs> and there's, and you know those two little armrests? Those were made for me, because I'm sitting there, and I'm grabbing them, and I'm looking around like this. And I look over at my friend, and my friend is like way cooler than me, more contemporary than me. She's like trying to pull me out of my old lady ways and bring me into the century that we are living in right now. And she looked scared just as much as I did. So I thought, good. Two things that I noticed about this church, though. They were the friendliest church I have ever been to. And it wasn't just the pastors. It was the congregation as well. Other thing I noticed is that church was packed with young adults who weren't just, oh, Sunday morning, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to get it off my checklist. They were, knew who Christ were and he, who he is, and they were on fire for Christ. I do not believe that Christianity is dying, but I do believe that it looks different than it has in the past. And that is what I want to explore with you today, this tension between what we think Christianity should look like and what it actually looks like in the present day. And Christianity is alive, and it's on fire for our Savior of this world. Last week, we talked about the Great Commission, the fact that Jesus has commanded all of us to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The reading for today is a great continuation into the great commandment last week. In the book of Acts, we are here, or, yeah, no, I think the great commission, not commandment, I'm sorry. In the book of Acts, we are hearing the account of the birth and growth of the early church and how the gospel has spread. And so as we look at chapter 10, and I encourage you to go back and read it for yourself because it's extremely dense and you might get a better understanding of what we talk about today. But as we look at the beginning, we meet a man named Cornelius, and he is a centurion or a Roman soldier. In verse 2 describes Cornelius as a God-fearing man, which in this context means he is a proselyte of the gates, which means he is a Gentile or a non-Jew who prays to God and he gives regularly, but he doesn't completely follow the Mosaic law like having a kosher diet, and he isn't circumcised. And it's God's plan to have Cornelius and Peter, the other man in the account for today, cross path. And they're about 35 miles apart. And God sends an angel to Cornelius telling him he must find Peter. And I just want to set the, the cultural bit here. 
there's this huge cultural divide between Gentiles and Jews. Jews believed that they were the only people who could be saved. They were God's chosen people. The Jews believed that to be saved, you had to follow. You had to be Jewish, and you had to follow the Mosaic law. In that time, it was more of a connection with God based off a of law than it was a relationship full of love and grace. And so as we continue in our reading for today, we also encounter a man named Peter, who is one of Jesus' disciples. He was the man who denied Peter three times, or excuse me, who denied Jesus three times before his crucifixion. And Peter begins praying, and he's hungry, so he falls into a trance. And then all of this food is placed out in front of him. And this was, a lot of this food was things that Jewish people were not accustomed to eating. And then the voice tells him to kill and eat. And I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a really, really good dream. Peter holds his ground, and he says, Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The Lord responds in his dream, saying, Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And the Lord continues to repeat this three times to Peter. While Peter is wondering what this dream means, he finds he gets invited to Cornelius' house. And as he goes to Cornelius' house, there's Cornelius and then like a little group in there as well, a little crowd or something like that. And he says to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for Jews to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown to me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. And here we see God is working on Peter's heart, one of legalism, changing it to one of grace and love. And so here we have a Roman soldier's home and a person who Peter thought could never be saved. And so we see this tension. We see Jew versus Gentile, but then we see Jesus in the middle reconciling them together. In that day, Peter preached the gospel. He said, God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. He then proceeds to give the testament to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And let's remember that Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. He saw Jesus and how he interacted with others. And he saw the resurrected Lord. The reading for today ends with Peter saying, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And I think the important question we ask ourselves since today is, how is this account relevant to us in today's world? And why is this important for each one of you sitting here today? I believe that God is calling us to change our approach to sharing his gospel with his people. In 2021, Gallup shared that for the first time ever, church membership has dropped below 50% nationally. Among millennials, only 36% identified with the church. Similarly, a decade ago, only 22% of millennials said they have no religious affiliation. In the year 2021, 33% of Gen Zs say they do not have a religious affiliation. And we can see that at the same time, attendance at church is dropping across the board. And I'm not sharing this information to scare you, because I understand that sometimes hearing this information can make us anxious or sad. And so we invite you to come join us next Sunday, and Pastor Mike will talk about navigating the emotions we might be feeling when we hear these, those statistics I shared with you. This is the one thing that I want to say about this, is that we must remember that God is greater than all of this, and he has commanded us all to go out and make disciples. 
The rest is up to God. And we know that God's power is not dying, and nor is his presence on this earth. And so now let's take those statistics and look just at our church here at Shepherd of the Hills. I do not think that our church is following those statistics that I just shared. I really believe that God is blessing us when we look at the membership trends. And we actually have a new membership class today. And so if you want to become a member, just join us over there. Well, that's not very descriptive, but join us out there after the service. Just follow me and I'll show you out there. I am sorry. I don't think Christianity is dying. But what I do think is that I think Christianity looks different from what it once looked like. And I think that is the tension that we are dealing with right now. It's not about Jews versus Gentiles like it was in Peter and Cornelius' time. But it's this misconception of what Christianity looks like right now in today's world. The thing that breaks my heart is when we look around just in our own congregation, we do not see a lot of young adults here. And if you want, you can look around, but I promise you I don't see a lot of young adults. We have this wonderful group of children. We have a great group of adults, and then we have a great group of seniors. But this is what I see missing. As soon as you get confirmed, we'll never see you again. And then we don't see anyone in college, and we don't see any young adults with children or without children. And I believe that God is encouraging us today as a church to reach those who we do not see sitting next to us in our worship service a little bit differently. God's word will never change. And it never has changed. And in the account for today, Peter doesn't take God's word and he doesn't water it down. He doesn't change God's message or just choose the parts he likes. In verse 34 through 43, Peter shares the gospel in Cornelius' home. And so I do not believe that God is calling us to change his word to fit what the society says is okay. But I do think that he is asking each one of us to change our approach on how we share the gospel with his people. In verse 27, a Jew enters the house of a Gentile, something that was not allowed. And a cultural barrier was broken. And God brought two groups together to share the gospel. Cornelius was the first, the first Gentile to be converted to Christianity. And the truth of the matter is, is that we also have a cultural barrier. What we think Christianity looks like and what it truly looks like now. And so my question to you is what can we do to invest in your kids, your grandkids, and your great grandkids so that they not know Jesus just in their head, but they know him in his heart. And how are we going to get to that place? Here are a few things that I've learned myself. This concept of rumps in the pews. The person needs to be in worship every Sunday to be a good Christian. I strongly believe in corporate worship in the literal church C. I believe that God is calling all of us to gather in community and worship him. And that is what he wants us to do 24-7. I also understand that in today's world, that is a really hard thing to do. To be at church every Sunday. When I was in high school, and it wasn't that long ago, but everybody could play. If you're on a sports team, you could play. And now I've been told that if you want any playing time on a sports team, you either have to be in like these private lessons or you have to join this like competitive soccer team so you can develop the skills you need to have just a smidge of playing time in a high school team. Here's the other thing is that this has to start from an early age. You can't just start in ninth grade because then you would miss all of this learning time. Another thing I cannot believe is how hard our society pushes our students. Just last week, I went, attended a track meet, and I was there for three hours. And the students I, were, I was there to watch, they were there before me, and they left after me because the team wanted them to stay 
to the end of the meet and drive, get on the bus back with them. I didn't leave there till 8 p.m. And so just imagine a student's life. I believe school starts at like 7.25, and so you gotta get up earlier than that, right? And then you sit through class all day, then you're gonna go to this track meet, right? And then it doesn't, and then you don't, and then you have to ride the bus home, so you probably get home, I don't know, 9, 9.30, then you gotta say hi to your family, you gotta eat, you gotta do your homework, and then you go to bed, all to do it again the next day, and be at school at 7.25 a.m. As much as I want our students in church worshiping God every Sunday, I am compassionate towards those who aren't because of the chaos of their lives. And here we see this tension again. You must come to church every Sunday, which is religion, or having this authentic relationship with God. Since I have been a shepherd of the hills, I understand that one of my goals is supposed to be increasing the amount of students that join us every night on Sunday for impact, which is our high school uh, ministry expression. And this has been told to me since I've been here, or since I started my call press, call process. And I understand that students must work, they must do homework, they need time to rest, they need time to hang out with their friends and their family. And they need time to reset for their next hectic week. And usually that falls on a Sunday night. And I would love for more students to come and be a part of impact, but I am compassionate about their circumstances. And here we see this tension again, religion telling us you must go to impact, and parents hearing, I must force my kids to go to impact. But what about that relationship part of having a relationship with Jesus Christ, the savior of this world? And what about our young college age students or our young adults with or without kids? Maybe they are just trying to figure the world out. Maybe they've gotten out into the real world and they do not know what they believe. Or maybe they haven't found a place where they feel comfortable to worship at. And so we have this tension in the church, just like there was tension between Peter when it came to understanding that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, could be saved by God too. And so I think we might have this misconception of what church looks like or Christianity looks like. We might think that it's every Sunday morning we all get up, we gather, we sing hymns, we read scripture, we pray, and we listen to God's word. And I don't think there is anything wrong with that. And for some, that is what church looks like. But I do believe God is asking us, what are we willing to invest in so that your kids, your great-grandkids, and your grandkids can know the Savior of this world like you all desire them to know? And now what I hope you don't think I'm saying is that we need to go get a fog machine. Because I've been asking Pastor Mike if we can get one, and he keeps telling me no. Oh, he's got one. Dave's got one. Great. Yes. Next sermon. Thank you, Dave. And I don't think we're going to get the best light system to have the lights like glaring in your eyes. And I'm not saying that we're going to get rid of hymns or the choir or the organ or any of those things. But I am wondering what we need to invest in so our Sunday morning worship experiences are comfortable for those who have not grown up in the church. God is calling us to change our approach of sharing his message with all nations. I wonder, instead of just focusing on the numbers, hoping that we have, you know, 200 plus students in impact every Sunday, what if we took the students that we do have right now and had each one of them in a discipleship relationship, either with a mentor or one of their peers? And I understand that the word discipleship is scary, but it's really not. It's getting and sitting down and reading God's word, and you don't have to know it all. Right now, I'm in a disciple relationship with one student, and I don't know how many times we open the Bible and I say, what is that word? What is that word? There's so many big words, and she has to tell me. Discipleship is about getting in a relationship with someone so they can see the way that you live your life that is pleasing to God. If we want 200 students at Impact tonight, all I need is we're going to throw in a, a Starbucks coffee bar, 
And then I just need like a, a lab, a, f- a free iPad, and I'll do a little giveaway, okay? And then we will get 200 plus students a night here at Impact. But here's my question for you. How many students will walk away knowing that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior? And how many students will we equip for the real world once they graduate high school? Or will their bellies be just full of free Starbucks? And I understand that we might not be the college hub of all churches, but what if we had a couple of college students that we were able to pour into? And they don't come every Sunday to worship because they can't. They're at school. But they start a small group Bible study in their dorm or amongst their friends. I am not saying that we need to turn our Sunday morning worship experience into that rock and roll concert that I experienced in Omaha but how can we take our Sunday morning worship experience and continue to make it comfortable for those who have not grown up inside of a church? God's word doesn't change, and it never will be changed. But throughout the Bible, and especially in the account for today, we see Jesus and those God uses to share his message, change their approach so that it can be heard by those they are sharing it with. If you look at the entirety of the Bible, we always see Jesus meeting people where they are at. And that is what God is calling us all to do. And unfortunately, it can't just be on myself and Pastor Mike. I've read that realistically, a person can disciple one to three people. And so if Pastor Mike and I were really great disciplers, we would only reach six people. What God is calling us to is a new approach, and it will take everyone. It will take the entirety of the church being willing to try something new, figuring out how we can change our approach to reach those who aren't sitting with us on a Sunday morning. And it's going to take boldness. We're going to have to try new things, and we are going to make mistakes. One of my mentors told me that you you never fail. The only thing you can do is either learn a lesson or you can have a success. And so we will need grace as we're trying new things, but we'll also need your boldness as you come and share ideas. I do not think that Christianity is dying but I be- because I think people are still looking for their purpose. There's so many students in the world who are wondering why they are here on this earth, and I believe that answer is Jesus. But I do believe that our culture is constantly changing And God is calling all of us as a church to change our approach so that we can fulfill his commandment to go out and make disciples of all nations. And so I want to leave you here with this question. In your own life and at Shepherd of the Hills, how might we need to change so that our children, our grandkids, and our great-grandkids can know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of your word. We just ask that you just put a fiery passion in our souls, Lord, so that we're able to just go out and fulfill your commandment of making disciples. Lord, we ask that you give us grace as we try new things and guide our hearts so that we can go out and reach the people that you have placed on each one of our hearts, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.